Welcome to Magic Arcanum! I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Burdick, and we're so glad you're here, because it's story time! Innistrad Crimson Vow is a bloody tale. It's centered around a vampire wedding, and the efforts of the Gatewatch to help Arlen literally save the day for the plane, but that's not all that happens. There were four side stories published, too, each giving us a glimpse at what some of the set's supporting characters were up to during the Endless Night, and before the glow of Neon Dynasty lures us to yet another world, I wanted to wrap things up on Innistrad with a nice little bow. Before we get to that, though, let me thank Into the AM for sponsoring today's video. The weather has gotten colder down here in Texas lately, and I am loving their new line of fleece, like this hoodie I'm wearing. It is super comfortable and warm without being bulky. And you know how much I love small details on this show, so I definitely appreciate the hidden side pockets and the double-lined hood. Which you can totally use to turn yourself into a wizard during game night. Anyway, check out Into the AM using my link down below, and you'll save 10% on your order, which can include things like brain-melting graphic tees, stylish workout gear with just the right amount of stretch, and magical fleeces for those cold winter nights. And since this is the season of giving, I'll pick one lucky fan to receive a $25 gift card. All you have to do to enter is like this video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment down below telling me which Into the AM product you'd spend it on. How's that for spreading some holiday cheer? All right, now let's get back to the creepy happenings of Crimson Vow. The first side story is called The Edge of the World, and it introduces us to Jacob Hawken as he visits a wealthy estate owner in Selhof. That is a port in Nefalia, and it's one where spirits gather in abundance, earning it the nickname The City at the Edge of the World. It appears that some of these ghosts have started targeting the morally bankrupt, and this estate owner, Nelik, has hired Jacob to investigate the matter, fearing that he himself may be their next victim. Joining him in the investigation is a woman named Eloise, and together they encounter a ghost named Millicent. Ultimately, Millicent reveals a local necro-alchemist put a bunch of spirits into a geist bomb and blew himself up with it, along with most of a neighboring town. That alchemist is now possessing people here in Selhof, including Eloise, briefly, and Nelik, the man that hired them. Jacob confronts the ghost, which is named Cyril Rav, while it is in Nelik's body. Cyril makes Jacob an offer. He realizes Jacob is tired and worn down by life on Innistrad, which appears to soon be ending for everyone anyway, thanks to the Eternal Night. So he suggests that they team up. Cyril is lonely, and Jacob has a sort of affinity for ghosts after growing up in a family that worshipped them. Eloise and Millicent are not present during this conversation, and by the time they reach the estate to intervene, Jacob and Cyril are both gone, leaving the reader to wonder if Jacob took his offer or not. So on the surface, this story is a spooky investigation with a ghost-based twist, but it's really more about how the common folk of Innistrad are really starting to crack under the pressure of the Eternal Night, especially after surviving their encounter with the Eldrazi. Viewed that way, it becomes a depressing piece about an investigator who may have been on his final case before deciding things had become so hopeless that he might as well ally himself with a wanted murderer if only to give himself a reason to keep on living. And the theme of despair continues into the second side story, which is the Blessing of Blood. This time, our central character is Audric, the master tactician, though he isn't feeling very masterful as of late. He has sequestered himself in a small church where he has spent weeks praying for forgiveness to an angel that no longer exists. You see, back during the Shadows Over Innistrad storyline, Audric had put a lot of blind faith into the church, even as Thalia warned him that it had become corrupt thanks to the influence of characters like Jaren. Audric now feels guilty for not listening to his friend sooner, 
because a lot of innocent lives probably could have been saved. And so that's where we find him, trying to make peace in his own quiet corner of the world, when things go from bad to worse. The vampire Henrika Domnathi comes to the church, eager to claim its Tears of Avacyn, and use them in a ritual to summon forth the demon Ormondal. She first taunts Audric and attacks him with waves of mind-controlled minions before Thalia makes a dramatic entrance and rushes to help her friend. The two humans then make a desperate stand together as Henrika invites her vampire followers to join in the assault. The vampires overwhelm the Cathars and begin to bite into Audric's flesh as the ritual to summon forth the demon plays out. Fortunately, though, Audric has been drinking holy water during his stay at the church, so the vampires that bit into him explode as his purified blood mixes with their own. Henrika realizes she is beaten and flees the scene as Audric spills the bowl of Avicen's tears, dispelling the ritual before the demon can materialize. Thalia and Audric stand in the now quiet church, and she asks him if he can still see the moon, a poetic way to ask if he has lost himself completely to the vampires, or if enough humanity remains in him that he can still function. He replies he can still see it, and Thalia nods in approval, leaving the reader to wonder what new challenges will await the master tactician as he grapples with becoming one of the very things he is sworn to destroy. Now don't get me wrong, Thalia and Audric are cool characters, and I really enjoyed Henrika in here too, but to me this felt a lot like Arvad the Cursed from Dominaria all over again. So now, on two different planes, we've got heroic fighters that have been bitten by vampires, and thanks to their faith, they're able to overcome it. Maybe, kind of, sort of. And every day is now a test for them. <laughs> anyway, the third and final story I'm covering today is simply called Survivors, and it follows a cleric named Torrens. Well, Cleric may be a bit of a stretch, because as the story opens, he's got a wagon full of cheap cures for the common problems of Innistrad, anti-werewolf serum, a necklace made out of bat bones to protect you from curses, and even a small silver mirror to reveal vampires. So he's a traveling merchant, but the folks in this little village aren't interested in what he's peddling. Instead, a man named Vetus approaches him with an offer. He says he knows that Torrens stole an enchanted weapon from the Cathars, but is willing to overlook that if he'd be willing to go investigate a mysterious sound coming from the town's nearby keep. Vetus even offers a generous amount of money to Torrens, which he begrudgingly accepts, figuring even if this ends up being dangerous, it's gotta be better than being turned over to the Cathars. So off he goes, along with Vetus' own son, Boris, to act as guide, and a local boy named Alexander who offered to help. They reach the keep, and Torrens and Alexander head in, with Boris locking the door behind them for the safety of the village. Pretty soon, they hear screaming, and Alexander rushes ahead. Torrens chases, but instead finds a woman chained to a bed. This turns out to be Eruth, who says Devils already took the boy, and she and Torrens will be next. Torrens realizes the whole village is probably a cult that regularly traps people in the keep to be used as demon food. Torrens removes her chains, and the two explore deeper into the keep, eventually finding the room holding Alexander. Of course, this is still in Estrad, so nothing is how it first appears. Alexander is currently possessed by a creature that calls itself Umbris, though it appears to be stuck in this room. On the floor, Torrens notices an iron circle engraved with runes, which must have bound the horror to this spot. Umbris explains that he has been here since the town was founded by Vetus's great-grandfather, and has been performing a valuable service this entire time. He claims that at night, when the people of the town rest, he absorbs their fears and sorrows, leaving them free to be happy. All he asks for in return is a steady supply of bodies to feed on. This might sound great, but it means people like Alexander don't remember ever having a sister, 
because her death caused him sorrow, so Umbris consumed all memory of her. Torrens realizes he cannot defeat Umbris, even with his stolen magical mace, but he can at least free the nightmare, so he smashes the iron circle and then offers a deal of his own. Umbris will leave town and return all of the stolen memories to the citizens. In return, Torrens will let him explore more of Innistrad and collect experiences beyond what he was able to gather from the confines of the keep. Alexander is saved, Eruth decides to stay and help lead the town, and the citizens turn on Vetus once they learn that he was willingly feeding people to a captive malevolent force. Umbris slips away in the darkness, grateful to be free again, and Torrens declares he has some unfinished business to attend to in Gavany as he watches mob justice be dealt to Vetus. So once again, we are left with an unsettling ending, and a main character who is a hero only in the loosest definition of the word. He did save Eruth and Alexander, and he gave a whole village of people their memories back, and removed their corrupt landlord but he also unleashed a nightmare horror on more unsuspecting victims. With Innistrad suffering under the Eternal Night, sacrifices must be made, and each person, whether they be an investigator, Cathar, or merchant, must make the choices that work for them. I really liked the side stories for Crimson Vow. They remind us nobody's perfect, and that the suffering on the plane reaches far and wide, which gives the hopeful mission of the Gatewatch that much more impact when it succeeds. That said, there are still plenty of characters who have cards that don't appear anywhere in the narrative for this set, leaving us with some mysteries to ponder for next time. Until then, let me thank Into the AM once more for sponsoring this video. Make sure you check them out using my link in the description and save yourself 10% on a hoodie that might just keep the chill of Innistrad from creeping into your bones. Then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see ya!